my, my last boss, uh, the chief, spoke, uh, as Jim was saying, at the Jackson Center last year. And I continue to have my suspicions that the way I ended up here is that Greg reached out to me to invite the chief to come speak. <laughs> I accepted and agreed to come speak. And he never had the heart to tell me that I wasn't the one he meant to invite. <laughs> so, but so I'm here, uh, so I'll try to make the best of it. In terms of how Justice Jackson's opinions affected my day to day, um, you know, it, it's not something I thought about every morning. You know, I wasn't brushing my teeth thinking, you know, what would Robert Jackson do? But um, he's he's obviously one of the, the most well regarded and in many ways most influential justices. Um, so, digression, but when I was going through the interview process, you're told a bunch of the questions that you might expect. And one of the common questions is, who's your favorite justice? Mm -hmm. um, and so, Robert Jackson is one of the safe answers. Um, <laughs> and the reason for that is that you know, he was a great justice, and he was also um, a really good writer. I, I mentioned the chief's sort of focus on not saying more than you need to. Um, I think that's something that Justice Jackson understood really well. Um, and, and maybe in part from the fact that he was from this area and had worked on a lot of different kinds of cases and really understood how to communicate things clearly and simply um, to an audience that wasn't necessarily uh, a legal audience. Um, and so his opinions stand up to the test of time really well because they're you know, they have law to them, but they also just have a lot of common sense. And so when you're deciding a case, it's really helpful to be able to look back at an older opinion that just makes a lot of sense. It sort of says, here's how you should think about this question. Here are these three different categories that you can think about government power in, and here's how you decide which one it's going to be based on common sense. As you recall, Justice Jackson was born in 1892 in Warren County, Pennsylvania. He was the only man in the history of the United States to become Solicitor General, Attorney General, and a Justice of the United States Supreme Court, which he became in 1941. Subsequently, in 1945 and 1946, he became the Chief American Prosecutor of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg a position which he deemed to be one of the most gratifying. Tonight, we have in our midst Phil Neal, who was Robert H. Jackson's law clerk during the 1943 and 44 Supreme Court terms. And we welcome Phil and Linda Neal. History also informs us that it was constitutional law professor Phil Neal who introduced his number one student, William H. Rehnquist, to his former boss, Justice Robert H. Jackson, while the justice was visiting Stanford Law School. We know because of that, oh, because of that visit, Justice Jackson was offered, offered the clerkship to William Rehnquist, and he accepted and he served during the 1951 and 52 Supreme Court terms. We also know, because all of you have read that fact, that our special guest, Chief Justice John G. Roberts, after graduating from Harvard Law School, clerked for Judge Henry Friendly, and then subsequently became the clerk for Associate Justice William Rehnquist during the 1980 term. You get the picture? <laughs> Warren County, Jackson, Rehnquist, of course that was through Neil, uh, Roberts, and just to complete the cycle, because you may not know this fact, this year, based on the good work of uh, an individual for the Honorable Jeffrey Sutton, it was Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, who was from Warren, Pennsylvania, Chief Justice Roberts hired as one of his law clerks, Ben Snyder, who happens to be from Warren, Pennsylvania. <laughs> did he mention that at all? He did. He talked about it. He, uh, he came back and he said, yeah, they, they were talking a lot about how there's this, this connection from Robert Jackson uh, to Chief Justice Rehnquist to me 
to you, Ben, and he, he had a, a fun time telling me about that. I was, I was a little embarrassed. Uh, it's, uh, having worked with the chief, it's sort of silly for me to think about that kind of comparison. Um, he, uh, he's really just a remarkable, remarkable lawyer and, and justice, and so um, I, I don't, I don't struggle with self-confidence, but I feel like I've, I've seen enough of him to, to really understand the difference in intellectual capacity and uh, sort of legal acumen uh, to know how, how far apart those are. But uh, it, was, it was a great honor to get to work with him. Justice Jackson is sort of a, mythical maybe is too strong, but he's, he's really one of those few justices that everyone kind of agrees is one of the, the best justices or one of the most um, influential justices to have, to have sat on the court. Um, when you're going through the process of interviewing for clerkships, uh, one of the questions that you sometimes get is, uh, who's your favorite justice? And I, I don't know that I ever actually got that question in an interview, but I remember thinking about it beforehand and, uh, and then asking people the question. And, and Justice Jackson is one of the most common answers. I think Jackson and Chief Justice Marshall are probably the two most common answers. Um, and I think to a certain degree that, that has to do with where he's from and the kind of lawyer that he was. Um, he, you know, he's from this area, um, which is a fairly plain spoken area, and he was really a generalist. Um, and so had a lot of experiences in a lot of different kinds of law. And I think that he was able to translate his experiences talking to lay juries and um, you know people who weren't necessarily the the Supreme Court bar he was able to take that and, and learn from that the ability to communicate very complex things in very straightforward and accessible ways and I think that's something that makes his opinions so influential today that you, you can just pick it up and it's common sense uh, and you don't always agree with it. Um, it you, you maybe get to the end and you say yeah that, that makes perfect sense and then you realize well uh, on the other hand, it, it, you know, it doesn't really have anything to do with the Constitution. Um, but I think that that ability to speak in a way that, that anyone could understand was, was really valuable to him. And I think to a certain degree that the chief has that as well. The chief really emphasizes being plain and, and straightforward in his language um, so that you get the point across as quickly as you can and, and in a punchy way. Um, and Judge Sutton too, for that matter, I sort of outside of that clerkship line, but um, I remember feeling really well prepared when I got to the court to clerk for the chief because I had spent a year working with Judge Sutton who um, just cares a, a great deal about language and how you use it in an opinion. And I, I had this little uh, piece of paper uh, that I cut or that I printed out and put on my desk that said positive negative because one of his his big legal writing uh, tips was that you always you always start out with the affirmative case for the for the position you're arguing and then after that comes why the other side is wrong and I struggled with that all the time and I would you know I would work on something and he would say no 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 you need to, to reorganize it and so I sort of slowly beat that into my head um, <laughs> but I remember that being very helpful when I got to the court.